And unlike Ephesus, Smyrna, which is uh, Izmar, is uh, as a functioning community today in western Turkey, a seaport town. It's got about 200,000 people in it. It's about 35 miles north of, uh, of Ephesus. It was an incredible, beautiful city in, uh, in this day, in 95 AD, as, as it is continues today. A seaport town that was uh, <clears throat> so fabulous that when uh, Alexander the Great went through it, he said it should be a, a model city <clears throat> for all other cities. He said this is what all Roman cities should, should look like. Uh, it had at the base where you, if you were to get off a ship, a street called the Golden Street. <clears throat> that gold or Golden Street would lead from, from the edge of the sea all the way to the top of Mount Pegasus. Many te temples lining each side, but at the top, the temple to Zeus, the chief god of the pantheon of gods of, uh, of Rome of that day. There was even a monument to Homer along the way because he was from Smyrna himself, uh, an impressive uh, uh, city. But uh, the, the thing that we want uh, to see here uh, is that they were a city that historically had always been very faithful to, to Rome. Uh, in 195, uh, again, 300 years before this, they had already built a temple to the goddess of Rome. And again, the Roman Empire uh, as an empire doesn't come into existence until 30 BC. So uh, they do this voluntarily. Later under the empire, there were certain things you were required to do as a Roman city. But the point is they had always been a very faithful city to, uh, to Rome. So much so that when uh, it came time to choose a city to build a monument to the emperor Tiberius in about 26 BC, this city is chosen. It's all very important to understand because, as we mentioned last week, <clears throat> there were the emperors very often as they died were deified and, uh, and they were claimed to be godmen who had ruled over the Roman Empire. That now has changed and you have emperors like the one reigning at this time, Domitian, who in their lifetime claim to be God and then demand to be, to be worshipped. <clears throat> the center of that worship, the center of that emperor worship was Smyrna. That's where the temple was. That's where the temple was uh, to the emperor. And once a year, every citizen had to come to that temple and burn incense and, uh, and say that Caesar is Lord or, or suffer the persecution. Early on, and they're experiencing it, it would mean that you would lose your job. Everybody worked in a type of a craft guild. If you weren't part of that guild, like a union, then you couldn't work. So they would be kicked out and lose their, their livelihood. So they're already, we'll see a comment by Jesus in terms of how poor they are, and it means poor like a beggar in terms of the people uh, in this church. So uh, that's important to, to note, the history and the background of the city, because it's the seat of emperor worship. Secondly, being a seaport town, uh, it also had a large community of Jews that were, that were living there who, uh, again, uh, very early on are bringing the opposition uh, against the church uh, as well. And of course, one of the, uh, and they were a legal religion under the Roman Empire. So they were not required to go to that temple once a year, burn the incense and say that, uh, that Caesar is Lord. As a legal religion, they weren't required to. That's why Luke, among other reasons, writes the book of Acts to try to make the link and prove that Christianity is another sect of Judaism, because if it is, it should not be persecuted. And that's why he includes one trial after another of Paul, because every time he goes on trial, he's declared innocent. See, we really shouldn't be being persecuted. Uh, and yet, again, the Jews living there at the time, and this church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, very cosmopolitan city reflected in the people in the church there. But uh, nonetheless, there were those. Jesus will address this situation in our text with some very, very harsh words, very difficult words for anybody to really accept if you, if you come from a Jewish background. Some very harsh words that are said by Jesus because of people that Paul would refer to as, as Judaizers. So there's a lot of persecution that's, that's uh, coming there. Smyrna is also known as, uh, uh, is kind of famous for the fact that um, uh, one of their pastors, 
who was uh, around at this time is uh, a guy named Polycarp. Polycarp literally studied with John. The Apostle John sat at his feet, learned from him, uh, and his words and his ministry were considered very powerful because of the fact that certainly John is the last of the apostles, and Polycarp is the last guy to have a direct tie with him. He sat at his feet, learned from him. He was his disciple. He was the pastor of this church. And of course, the persecution would, uh, would, would grow tremendously, and by the time that uh, Polycarp is a very old man, nearing 100 years old. On February 22nd, 166 AD, he's tied to a stake and it's lit on fire uh, and he's uh, burned and becomes a, a martyr for his faith and the ministry that he had there in, in, uh, in Smyrna. What Jesus is saying is going to happen, happened. And that's, that's important to understand. And maybe you'll bring a little more weight to some of the things that uh, Jesus says. The classic line of Polycarp is he's asked to just, just say, Caesar is Lord. We don't even care if you mean it. Just say it so that we don't have to do this. And his uh, famous line, recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, 80 and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Bring forth what thou will. And uh, willingly went to his death uh, with a as we would say, the good confession on his lips. That wasn't the end. They thought that uh, by, by killing Polycarp, they would, in a sense, wipe out the growing numbers of Christians in, in the church at Smyrna, uh, but that did not do it. And it was only a few years later that uh, they, they killed 1,500 on, on that mountain where, where Zeus's temple was, Mount Pegasus, where the golden street led to the top of it, they uh, martyred 1,500 Christians at one time, and it said the blood flowed off Mount Pegasus because of all those that had died. That wasn't enough. It was a very short time later. They did the same thing to another 800 uh, uh, Christians, men, women, and children that were martyred for their faith. So when Jesus addresses this church and says, you're undergoing persecution, but it's going to get worse. But I have a couple of things to say to you. They're certainly worth, worth listening to. Now, Smyrna itself uh, is um, it's where we get our word myrrh. It means uh, bitter, but of course the, the myrrh itself must be crushed in order to get the, the sweet fragrance. It plays a part in certainly in the birth of Jesus. Remember the wise men brought three gifts to him gold because he was a king, incense because he is our great high priest, and myrrh, which is used for embalming because uh, he would die for our sins. And we find, in fact, in John's gospel in chapter 19, myrrh was used in the embalming of, of Jesus Christ. In terms of the, the relevancy of, of this particular message to this church, uh, again, keep in mind, we've said often that there were uh, more Christians martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than in any other previous century. In other words, persecution against Christians, killing them because of their faith in Jesus Christ, is increasing. It is not <clears throat> decreasing. And we have every reason to believe that, that that is not going to change. Every time we look at any passages <clears throat> about living in the end of the end times, we see that uh, there will be a greater persecution that comes along uh, with it. I was just reading about um, one case, just to maybe bring this down to a, a level we can all understand. How many of you have ever att attended a Bible study in somebody's home before? That's, that's oh, terrible, you criminals, you know, because just recently in San Diego, a pastor that had a weekly Bible study with 15 people coming to the Bible study <clears throat> was ordered by the city and county of San Diego to cease and desist that activity and, and had a fine brought upon him. Now, fortunately, there would have been a day 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when just the sheer intimidation of a lawsuit or a threat like that would have ended that Christian activity. But praise God, there's organizations like the Center for Law and Justice, the Alliance Defense Fund, other Christian attorneys that have really grouped together around the country. Uh, they went on the behalf of that pastor, that church, and that Bible study uh, and basically pointed out that the law guarantees them religious freedom. There's nothing wrong with what they were doing. 
uh, and basically they got an apology from the city and county but, uh, uh, and are able to continue that Bible study. Only to say that th that's only a little example, the tip of the iceberg of the things that are happening. How many know every June there's uh, articles in, in, the, uh, in the news about will this student body be allowed to pray? Will that valedictorian, that's the smartest person in the class, by the way, uh, will they be able to get up and say the name Jesus when they're giving credit uh, for, uh, for how they achieved all that they had done academically? Big issue, big issue, big court battles every year. Can you say the name Jesus in public? Uh, our, our founding fathers would have never imagined the kind of day that we, that we live in today. And apparently it's going to get worse. And, uh, and we've mentioned some of the reasons why in previous messages. So let's take a look at the text. I think it has relevance for us and we can learn from the words of Jesus. Verse 8, And to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These things say, The first and the last who was dead, who came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, and are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So the message to the church at Smyrna. First thing we note is that, and uh, the best I can, because there, there are similarities and pattern of the seven messages stick to a, a similar outline. So first we know that Jesus communicates his message to the church at Smyrna there in verse 8. And the first thing he communicates is the hope of the resurrection. I mean, if you're, if you're facing possible death, what is, what is probably the... The number one thing you'd like to hear off the lips of Jesus is that it's okay. Even if you die, you're going to live with me for uh, forever and ever. He does that first by saying that he is the first and the last, establishing once again his eternity, and that he has the power to <clears throat> make these, uh, these remarks. So no matter what God's people are experiencing, the Lord says, I can identify with you and where you're at, even in death, that you might be raised again from the dead. But secondly, he communicates the fact that he is the first and the last. And, and again, from that uh, description of Jesus in chapter 1, you'll note that portions of that description are then given to each of these churches, again, to make sure that they completely understand who, who Jesus is. And this is another one of those uh, titles and passages that declare his, his deity. If you have those guys that knock on your door with their little books for sale, pamphlets for sale, or the guys in the white shirts on the bicycles. Uh, here's a couple of other passages that they'll find just fascinating. And uh, let me give you a couple of references because, um, again, if you're a note-taker, like to collect these things because you like to share with those that deny the deity of Jesus Christ, here's a couple of more clear-cut ones. Very interesting. Uh, if you go back to Isaiah, Isaiah 41, uh, 4 says, and I've got this for you, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord am the first, and with the last I am he. So here, again, if you were to take someone from the Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or, or another group that denies the deity of Christ, they would declare that that is God, uh, that is Jehovah God, or they might say God the Father, dependent upon the group. And then you can take them to Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer. Who's the Redeemer? That's the Messiah that's going to come and save us from our sins, according to Isaiah. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Uh, and you'll note that the first Lord there in verse 6 is all capitals indicating that it's Yahweh or Jehovah. But also when it mentions Redeemer, it's still Yahweh or Jehovah. And so there in Isaiah, we have a very clear declarative statement that God, and there is no other, is the first and the last, 
And then in our text, again, we have Jesus declaring that he is the first and the last. Uh, he is God Almighty. Very important if you were facing persecution to know that the words of Jesus were true, that he is God eternal, and he was able because of that to come and live a perfect sinless life and die on a Roman cross so that our sins might be forgiven so that you and I could be with him no matter what happens to us on this, on this earth. And I want to suggest if you're suffering very difficult times, heaven starts looking pretty good, doesn't it? And it's good to know that you'll be there because of what Christ has done, done for us. Um, a couple of trips ago to, uh, to China, I think it was Kathy and I in the, in the Takamoris, and we were in a, a city uh, in, in the south uh, of, uh, of China. It was a, a fairly large city, and, and in fact, the, uh, the folks that we're going to be delivering Bibles to uh, on that occasion were able to actually have a church and operate a church somewhat in the open, and we were able to visit them, which is a very unique situation, simply because for a number of years in this inner city, uh, they had run, this person was a doctor, a surgeon, and had run a medical clinic there. Uh, and therefore, it was a free clinic. So she's, in a sense, helping out uh, the local authorities. And so the local authorities there allowed her to build a little church on the back of the clinic. And so very unique uh, to be able to actually visit a Chinese church in, in China. And, you know, you're, you know, when you're traveling, it's busy. We didn't even realize what, what day it was when we showed up to deliver the Bibles. And we went around the back, and we're meeting people, and we come around the back, and there's the, and, and the church is like a hollow tile brick, you know, cement floor, tin, tin roof, you know, pretty basic, little wooden benches, typical uh, Chinese church. Uh, and uh, there's all these people coming that were there. <laughs> it kind of occurred to me. It's Sunday. There's a good reason for that. You know, you just got to kind of get lost in the day. So here we are. We happen to be there uh, on a Sunday. And they were coming out, but they saw us. They realized, at least me, there's at least one big, tall, dumb, dumb holly with them. Everybody else kind of kind of blends in, which helped us be able to go more places uh, on that particular trip. But um, they figured that, you know, they knew why we were there. So they went back into the church. They were all coming out. And and so we sat down and we were uh, introduced and we had uh, a gal with us from Hong Kong, one of, one of uh, Tina's relatives there, another Wong, and uh, she was, uh, had been our translator, very good translator. And so uh, they're basically introducing us and when they find out that, uh, that I'm a pastor, then they, uh, of course, this is all being translated to me. And she said, you know, the translator turns around and she says, uh, she says, they would like you to come up and share since you're a pastor. Oh, okay. I mean, share like uh, greet them from the churches in Hawaii or maybe share a little testimony. No, they want you to preach a sermon. I said, um, oh, okay. When? She says, right now. <laughs> I said, and she stood up. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're doing this right now. Mike, let me have your glasses. <laughs> I didn't have any glasses. <laughs> grab somebody else's Bible. Okay. I got to be able to see a couple of verses here. And so from the time I stood to the time I, you know, reached the front of the church, I determined, I had determined a text. What, what would I teach? What would I preach on to a persecuted church? Immediately came to mind John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Is that a relevant text, do you think, for that little group of, uh, of people sitting there who had undergone uh, various ages, and certainly the older ones had gone through the Cultural Revolution and, and had suffered tremendous persecution uh, over the years. It's a relevant statement that Jesus makes. When things seem like they're worst, uh, that's when we need to remember what are we really living for. That's what he's saying to them. You're really living for heaven. If you're going to really get through the worst of the worst times in this life, it's going to be because we have our eyes fixed on the prize which is not having the most toys here or the most esteem from uh, those around us, but eternal life with Jesus Christ forever. So he communicates the message, and I think the message is primarily the one of the resurrection. And then he commends the, the church in three areas. Verse 9, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. But notice Jesus says, but you are rich. And he says, so they're commended for their works and 
We're reminded that last week the church in Ephesus was commended uh, as well. And, uh, and that's a good thing. Again, Jesus is saying that I see everything that you do for my sake, whether it's in your home or at work, whether it's something you do at the shopping mall, something you say, something you do, whether it's, uh, you know, again, vacuuming the carpets, teaching a Sunday school class, whatever it might be, Jesus sees everything that we do uh, for his sake. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while well doing. For in due season, we shall reap a harvest if we do not lose heart. So we're reminded that of once again, as the previous church letter. Uh, secondly, they're commended for their tribulation. The word means pressure, as I mentioned, but it's pressure from an outside source. So they're facing pressure and trouble, and we'll see it's from other people, other people in their community. And, and certainly we, not to this degree, but to some degree, we, we all face that at some point in time. Paul tells Timothy, if you live godly for Jesus Christ, you will face tribulation. You'll, uh, and so if, it, uh, if that has not happened to you, cheer up. It's, it's in your future. It's, uh, it's going to be there at some point in time. And uh, these words might become more, more precious to you at that time. But remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When it happens, there's nothing unique about it. Peter says, don't be surprised when you fall into fiery trials. It's something we should anticipate, something we should expect. Again, the reminder of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and here is that the way we deal with it is we either get really mad and really upset and really bitter and why is this happening to me? Or we look to heaven, we understand this is the norm, it's to be expected, but I can rejoice, not because I like what's going on, I can rejoice because of the reward that awaits me and because I can anticipate God's grace sustaining me through it if I'll look to him. Again, what do you do when people slander you? Get even. <laughs> no, Jesus says, actually rejoice. Very, very hard to think to do apart from an eternal perspective. Uh, third, they're commended for their poverty, but again, Jesus says they're, they're rich. Then again, the word poverty refers to a beggar that has, that has nothing. And we've mentioned a couple of reasons why this was true in the, in the church, but uh, there in Smyrna. And one is that... Um, uh, most of the church, most of the churches, they were slaves that had come to faith uh, in, in Jesus Christ in the Roman world. Uh, I mean, that could mean everything for like Luke, who was a doctor, you know, right on down to somebody that was a common laborer, uh, but they didn't have a lot of money, and so they were poor. Uh, secondly, because of the Roman imperial cult, as I mentioned, that was there in Smyrna, uh, they would very often, when they became Christians, lose their jobs, lose their, their, their livelihood. And then, and then also, the same thing would happen if you were Jewish and you place your faith uh, in Jesus as the Messiah. If your whole family had not done that, then you would be ostracized from that family as well, meaning that you would lose your job normally uh, like the others. But Jesus says, you guys materially are poor like a beggar that has nothing. He says, but you're rich. Now, how is that possible? Well, simply because Jesus was speaking from an eternal perspective. In terms of what they had on this earth, it was very little. In terms of what they would have in heaven, they would be very rich. And uh, uh, I just think that that's such a, a, a great line. Again, the true measures of riches should be uh, in heaven. Those are the ones that are going to last forever. We've talked before about the idea that when you go in a, a, a another country or come out of that country, you've got to exchange your currency. So you have something to spend. Your money or U.S. dollars won't do you any good in Japan. You need yen, so you need to exchange it. When we get to heaven, we need to have <laughs> heaven dollars in a sense. Not that we'll need them, but uh, the riches that are stored there can only be stored from, from this side. We can't take a blank check with us. Meet St. Peter at the Golden Gate and uh, go through a money exchange. There's ways that we can store and live for uh, all eternity 
these guys, even though they did not have much materially in heaven, apparently they were going to be uh, very wealthy. And uh, apparently Jesus expected that that would be something they would need to hear at this point as well. Uh, all about the future, nothing about this life. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to endure. You may have to even endure to the point of death. But uh, please keep in mind what awaits you in the future. So he communicates his message. He commends them in three areas. And then he condemns those who claim to be Jews who are not. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the tougher verses in the New Testament uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, somebody from a Jewish background, you're trying to share that Jesus is the Messiah, and then they come across this line. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue uh, of Satan. So he condemns those who are blaspheming the church. And if you've got a uh, NIV, it gives you the, the real thought there. The, the blasphemy that was going on here is the idea of slander. So they were, being, they were being slandered. They were being ridiculed. Things were being said about them that were absolutely not true. And uh, if, you watch, <laughs> if you watch much in the in terms of media, uh, movies, television, the news, and so forth. The, this goes on all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, God help a, a politician who claims to be a born-again Christian because they will have horrific things said about them, uh, about their family, about their values, and, uh, and so on and so forth. It's, uh, uh, it's very difficult days. Uh, same thing can happen in your own, your own workplace and so forth. It can be very very difficult. But again, remember the words of Jesus to uh, don't, don't fear those that can, you know, kill the body, but fear him who can uh, kill body and, and soul. And so our fear of God needs to be greater than the fear of man. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 19. He says, for this is commendable if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Uh, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be slandered. He knows exactly what it is to be ridiculed. Uh, and yet he says, but I've set an example for you. When it's happening, though the temptation is great, don't defend yourself. <laughs> Just entrust yourself to him who judges uh, justly. A very difficult thing to do, but I'm confident that in those situations, God's grace is, is sufficient. He never leads us into a place of temptation that he doesn't then provide a, a way out, Paul says. So again, they were being openly slandered and apparently on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, I think we, we are as Christians as well. Uh, can I just point out the fact that it didn't stop the gospel from going forth? <laughs> Well, it was, what was some of the slander? Well, uh, because of the, uh, uh, taking the, the Lord's table, the Eucharist, taking uh, communion, uh, and we understand that we've got symbols that are representative, grape juice, representative of Christ's blood to remind us of his death. Uh, the, the cracker uh, uh, there to, uh, uh, to remind us of his body that was broken. So the slander was they eat human flesh and they drink human blood. And it's part of one of their secret rituals. That story was told over and over and over again. It was common through the Roman Empire. That's what Christians did. What do you know about Christians? They're cannibals and they drink blood. Anybody could tell you that. You know what? People came to faith in Jesus Christ anyway. They didn't care what they heard because they realized that they were sinful and they wanted to be forgiven and they wanted some hope out of this life and to live for all eternity. They didn't care. They came and asked anyway. There were horrible things that were said, but it didn't prevent the Holy Spirit from using people to share their witness, their testimony, and the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And I want to suggest that the same Holy Spirit is still alive and at work uh, and wants to do the same thing in our midst, even if people say, 
They say wild things <laughs> about Christians and the things that are said about us today. Very, very interesting. We were watching just a, a basic kind of a kid's movie uh, the other night, and, um, and the, the bad guy in it was uh, the, the worst guy in it, big scar on his face, the bad guy in it was a Protestant minister <laughs> who was going around killing people in this, uh, this movie, Geared for Kids. Uh, you know, and uh, that, that's an over-the-top example, but uh, there's more subtle examples that are out there uh, all the time. You know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the world that we live in. It was that way in John's day. It's that way today. Uh, we need to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he condemns those who say they are Jews but are not. And uh, as we've mentioned, it's just a historical fact that much of the early church uh, uh, in terms of persecution was prompted by, by Jews, and uh, even though the church was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And as I said, Paul refers to them in the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, many times refers to them as Judaizers. And that is, um, they wanted, uh, again, anybody that could know God to, to come to a relationship God with God the same way that they did. And they believed uh, that uh, because they were born uh, and had that particular heritage, because they followed the, the law of Moses, the Torah, kept the commands, because they were circumcised on the eighth day, uh, the way the covenant with Abraham was dictated, because they did those things, they were guaranteed a place in heaven, and nothing could prevent them from having that. So this idea that they needed to place their faith also now in Jesus as the Messiah, they certainly uh, discarded that, did not believe that. They might even acknowledge that he was a good teacher, a great prophet, but they did not need that for salvation. And they felt like Paul and other Jewish rabbis that were out there teaching in the synagogues were undermining their, their particular brand uh, of, the, of the faith. And, uh, and of course, they're uh, there are the ultra-Orthodox Jews today that hold to those same teaching, those same uh, values. But uh, Paul says, no, it's a, it's a hard problem. Uh, it, it can be remedied through a couple of, uh, of rituals. Uh, listen to what Paul says uh, in Romans 2, 28. He says, for, uh, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is, an, is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul says you, you can follow the practice of circumcision outwardly, but it won't help you because it's your heart that needs the flesh cut away. The heart is what has to be changed. Uh, and so, though it was a good thing to follow the Torah, to follow that, and as they should, it was a good thing for them to circumcise their male children on the eighth day, uh, which they did. That was a good thing, but it doesn't get them to, to heaven. And, and these were those that were bringing the persecution uh, uh, against the Christians, Jews, Jews and Gentiles, making up this church there. Because they had forgot what it was all about. When a mother and father circumcised their son, they were saying, we believe in the Abrahamic covenant, which promises the Messiah. They were actually, that was their messianic hope. It was the sign that one day God would bring his Messiah and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through this descendant of Abraham. We believe that. We believe the Messiah is coming. Therefore, we're going to do this uh, in anticipation of what God's going to do in, uh, in the future. Now, again, interesting, there are some very old church traditions that then took that teaching uh, and then replicated it in infant baptism. Uh, they believe that if they baptize their infants, then it would actually, through that ritual, guarantee them a place in heaven. And if you weren't baptized, then you might not be able to, to make it to heaven. Many older church traditions uh, teach that. What they were doing was taking everything taught under Judaism about circumcision and now replacing it with a different kind of ritual. But as we just dedicated Luke... I don't think Luke has the ability yet to confess Jesus Christ <laughs> as Lord. 
But his parents are saying, we have a messianic hope, Jesus Christ. He's our Messiah. He came and died for our sins, and we're going to be in heaven with him one day. And we want our son, we want our children to be there with us. And so we dedicate them to the Lord. We pray that uh, they will follow in our footsteps. A very, a very beautiful ceremony, a very important thing, uh, but not one that brings condemnations against others as the teachings of the Judaizers. Let's get on to this, uh, the third statement here that, that really ruffles feathers. Jesus condemns those who are a synagogue of, of Satan. Now, of course, <clears throat> he didn't say a church. He didn't say a mosque. He didn't say anything else. He said a synagogue. So, uh, again, if you're, uh, if you're Jewish, you're, you're sharing the gospel with somebody that's Jewish, and they happen to read this verse, you put those two words together, synagogue and Satan, it's not going to go over big. I can just, uh, I can just tell you that. It makes it even worse in a sense because this is from the lips of, of Jesus. So what's going on with this statement? Well, really, what's, uh, he's basically just saying that uh, those that are slandering are really not Jewish in terms of the faith because they have not accepted the teaching of the Old Testament that proclaimed the Messiah would come. And then when the Messiah came and fulfilled that teaching, they did not accept him. Therefore, they're not really accepting the word of God. They didn't place their faith in the Messiah as they should have. So they've rejected the Messiah. They're not really Jewish in that sense. Uh, and then secondly, he's saying the slander is actually coming from those in the synagogue that hold that position I've just described. <clears throat> kind of... How does this kind of affect us? It just basically says Satan uses people. <laughs> Satan uses people to bring slander. So where is the real attack coming from, according to Jesus? It's coming from Satan. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's some real uh, horrible things that are happening to them, and it's being uh, originated and orchestrated from the pit of hell. It's a satanic attack against them. Now, we, before we started this series, I just stopped and did three weeks on spiritual warfare just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's not to say that everything that happens to us that might be bad is right from Satan. A lot of times, I think most of the time, we suffer difficult things in this life because of our own bad decisions, whether you're a Christian or not. You just make, make bad decisions and, and you suffer because of it. Uh, the other factor certainly is the fact that we live in a fallen world, so our uh, you know, our, our, our bodies aren't getting healthier and stronger. They're getting uh, weaker and, uh, and so forth. And, and we suffer things in this world because we live in a world that's not perfect and it's a fallen world. We suffer the cancer and the repercussions of, uh, of all of those things medically, as well as the turmoil that comes uh, our way, like uh, the hurricane that I'm sure will fizzle out, but is uh, on its way uh, to, the, uh, to the islands now. We'll just have to watch that. Those are things that are part of a fallen world. But besides those two things, there is directly attacks at times against us right from Satan. They were being attacked through slander. That's the blasphemy he's talking about. It's going to get worse in terms of tri uh, tribulation, ultimately persecution. Ultimately, they would have to surrender their lives to the flames if they were going to continue to follow Jesus Christ. And it's coming right from the pit of hell. It's a satanic attack against them. And if we kind of somehow deny this or wash over this, <laughs> you're, you're going to be in big trouble because uh, Satan's got you. But if we realize that these things do happen, sometimes there is satanic oppression against us. There are things that are hurting us and we recognize it. Well, there's something we can do then. We can pray. What does Paul say in Ephesians 6, 11? Put on the, full armor, the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Schemes, very specific schemes for a very specific time sequence for a specific individual is what that word means. He's very patient. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places." Yes, there, there were people, and yes, they were Jewish, and yes, they were part of the synagogue, and yes, they had a certain set of, of beliefs that made them in opposition to these Christians. But the driving force behind them, the real oppression against them, what would lead to the persecution was right out of the pit of hell. And Jesus says, you need to recognize that. You need to realize when it's happening, 
could be your own bad decisions. It could be because you live in a fallen world. But you need to be able to distinguish when it's from Satan so that you can get on your knees and engage the enemy in spiritual warfare. And as long as you are unaware and unarmed, you're not going to have much of a chance in the conflict is the idea. And so Jesus is making them aware of the source of the conflict. Sometimes we get upset with those movies and those newspapers and those internet articles and those people in the broadcast industry that say terrible things about Christians. But we really need to get upset and mad against Satan, who basically is motivating and driving that whole, you know, again, tribulation or suffering against, uh, against Christians. The fourth thing, Jesus gives them the courage to endure the suffering, and that's in verse 10. Do not fear those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. So uh, again, uh, courage, uh, that's what it is. When you encourage someone, you give them courage. And he's giving them courage to, uh, to not fear what is about ready to come upon them. He says the devil is behind it. He's predicting that it's going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and he wants them to be aware again of the source of what's going on so that they'll engage the enemy, so that they'll pray. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Paul pretty concerned about this idea of prayer, and prayer guarding them against wicked and evil men, because it's being instigated by satanic forces. It refers to the devil. The second thing he wants to encourage them in is to see suffering as, as a test that uh, it's happening, he's aware of it, he's predicting it's going to happen in the future, he can look ahead and tell what's going to happen, and he says, uh, I want to encourage you and just see it for what it is, that if it's coming into your life, it's because I'm allowing it to come into your life. And we've spent uh, other messages dealing with this whole idea of why God allows trials or testing in our lives. Let me just mention uh, four, four reasons that, that he does. One is trials can show us what's in our own hearts. Sometimes, unless, it's, unless things get really difficult for us, we don't even know our own faith. We don't know the strength of our faith. Uh, we don't know how much we can trust God's word, how much we can rely upon it, how much we, uh, we need the Lord and, and others. Uh, sometimes it's to show us how weak we are. Uh, again, 2 Chronicles 32, 31 of Hezekiah, it said, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. And if you've been through difficult times, you'll find at some point in time there are things in your heart, either weaknesses or strength, that you may not have been aware of. And God allows it for that reason. Secondly, trials can come to humble us. To uh, Corinthians 12, Paul says, <coughs> of his own trials, he says, it was to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Paul, who healed so many others, himself could not be healed. And he says, and God did it uh, so that I wouldn't become prideful. And uh, trial, trials can, uh, can really humble you. You know, as I've mentioned before, my wife thinks I'm just a wonderful person when I'm really sick because I'm, you get really humble then. <laughs> you appreciate everything that everyone does for you. You get... You can get very, very humble. The Lord allows that. Humility is a good thing, for God gives grace to the humble. Thirdly, trials may come to call us to an eternal and heavenly hope. So again, our career, our education, possessions, our own self-sufficiency, a lot of these things go out the window when, when trials come. It causes us to, uh, to look to heaven. As we've mentioned already, that is the first thing that... Uh, uh, the Lord speaks to this church. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, a classic verse, for, me uh, uh, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will, will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. None of us like tension 
and pressure in a sense, but this is a good one. All Christians should have this tension in their life. The tension of, I desire and depart to be with Christ, which is the best thing that could ever happen to me. Yet I want to remain, that there might be fruitful labor, that I might be able to minister, share the gospel, show Christ's love to, to others. Those are the two things that are stretching me, that should make me really a healthy and mature believer. Uh, and uh, to have that eternal perspective. Trials, trials can do that for us. And fourthly, trials may come and able to help uh, to better uh, help others uh, in these trials. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Paul says that uh, going through trials will actually equip and enable us to be able to empathize and understand other people's difficulties and actually equips us. Yeah, you know, sometimes when, when people do come forward for, for prayer, they've got a concern and they've got a situation that is very specific that I know somebody else has been through. The, the first thing I do is go, hey, come over here. And I try to connect them together. Because the person that went through that same prolonged illness, that same surgery, that same kind of job loss, whatever it might be, same kind of financial problems, if I can put them together and that person can say, oh, I went through this, this, and this. It's exactly like you. But let me tell you what God did in our lives through it. Let me tell you how God was faithful. That's a lot better than a sermon or take two Bible verses and see me in the morning. Uh, if you can get together with somebody if you go through something and you see God be faithful through it, you will be equipped then to minister to others that have to go through that, that same circumstance. Those are four things. And uh, I think in previous messages, we've listed seven or eight. But uh, what Jesus is saying to them, he's predicting the tribulation. He's predicting the suffering. Do you think they would imagine how bad it would be? I don't think they really imagined how bad it would be. Yet he's predicting and he's saying, in a sense, it's going to be a test. I'm allowing it, but it's, it's for a purpose, uh, it's for a reason. Uh, and then this, uh, this phrase uh, about the, uh, the 10 days. They're to have courage and understand the suffering will have a specific time period. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? I mean, I, I know I've, I've had a couple of, <laughs> one in particular, pro prolonged uh, illness and everything, and I have some inner ear problems sometimes, and when I do, it's like having the flu for nine months. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it would be really, would have been really great if somebody could said to me that what you're going through now will only last nine months. Nine months, nine months only, you know? And the, you, on the calendar, when you hit that day, it'll all be over. It's like, all right, I can do this. It's the not knowing. It's not knowing when it will end. It, it, and, and anybody that's been through a prolonged illness is going, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's that not knowing. You don't really know the diagnosis. You don't know really exactly what's wrong. You're still trying to find out. You don't know how long. We'll, well, we're going to try this. We're going to try this. This might work. If it doesn't, we have another option here. You know, it would be so much easier if they could say, uh, it's like 12 and a half days, and then that's it. This thing is all over. Okay, just do what you got to do, and I can suffer through it. And Jesus comes along and says, it's actually a limited period of time that you're going to have to go through this. Now, let me just give you a couple of views of this because you may have heard them and then, and then explain the, the real view, <laughs> the correct view. Uh, there's three views. One is that 10 days means that the 10 general persecutions that uh, believers went through in terms of the Roman Empire. And there were 10 Roman emperors. There were 10 either partial or empire-wide persecutions. The problem with the first one started with Nero, who's already off the scene before Jesus ever says this. So it kind of and that kind of nullifies that, that view. It, uh, it doesn't line up historically. The second view is that it's, it's 10, not 10 days, but 10 years, because a fellow named the worst of the worst was a guy named Diocletian. Uh, and that was one of those empire-wide. It was his goal in life to completely exterminate Christians, Christianity, and burn every copy or scroll he could get uh, of, of the word of God. He reigned for 10 years, so they say... Uh, that, that was it, 303 to 
to 313 AD. The problem with that is Jesus says this is about ready to happen. It doesn't say like 200 years later. No, it's about ready to happen. So what does the 10 days mean? It's just a Jewish idiom. It just means a short period of time. We see it used many times in the Old Testament, Genesis and Job, Daniel, and so forth. If, if you kind of go to your concordance and you look up uh, 10 days or 10 time periods or whatever, you're going to see it used just as a, a figure of speech, a Jewish idiom. It means a short period of time. And that's what they would have, John would have understood that. They would have understood that as well. You're going to go through difficult times, but it's a short period of time. What if it's most of my life? It's still a short period of time compared to all eternity. Whatever we're going through, whatever you have to suffer in this life, it is a short period of time. And in the end, we will live with the Lord for all eternity. All right. I just have to pause and just say that, uh, you know, we're, we're not being threatened. You know, the secret police isn't waiting outside to arrest <laughs> any of us. Uh, and if you have uh, uh, go to China with us and meet some of the believers there that have been in prison for 20 years plus for their, for their faith and are very concerned about uh, meeting and so forth, uh, you can realize how much more important a text like this is than it is to us. But I want to suggest that all of us suffer to some degree because the, the suffering is the result of outside pressure, not something we've done, outside pressure that is originated uh, from, from Satan himself. And we all, at some point in time, come under these kinds of attacks. We need to be aware of it. We need to pray. We need to put on the full armor of God <clears throat> so that we can go through it with a good testimony on our lips, give God the glory, experience his grace, be more equipped to help others in, uh, in the future. And all of this is tied to living for all eternity, not for the things of this world. If you live for the things of this world as a believer, and you can, uh, you, you'll have a difficult life. You'll become bitter over the hard things that happen. And you will say, why did God allow this to happen to me? What did I deserve that this is going on in my family, in my life? And those questions will plague you until you begin to look at the Lord and the words of Jesus and his perspective on why he's allowing it. And it is for a reason. And he never wastes the blood of the suffering of any of his children ever it's always for a reason. It's always for a purpose. We just need to keep our eyes on him. And fifthly, he promises an eternal compensation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. <clears throat> so again, the compensation is not here on this earth. It's, uh, it's in heaven. Smyrna was a uh, key participant in what we would call the Olympic Games uh, or the precursor to them uh, in ancient Greece. They would be very familiar with this idea of giving uh, a crown, we might say a, a haku, and, uh, uh, and they are going to receive that. Uh, it's a martyr's crown. We've talked before already, there's, there's five crowns that are, that are given in, in heaven. There's one for those who love uh, and long for his appearing, every person here that's a believer in Jesus Christ, can receive that crown. Uh, there's a crown for just placing your faith uh, in, uh, in Jesus Christ and living a righteous life before him. Everyone here could receive one of those crowns. Of course, there's the martyr's crown. There's a, a crown for being a, a leader in a, in a church and uh, uh, in, in others. But the whole idea, there is a reward to this if you suffer this kind of this kind of. Uh, persecution that leads to your death. Now, James mentions the same crown and uh, relates that to uh, enduring temptation. He says, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the same word there, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who, who love him. So again, enduring temptation, those who love him, same crown mentioned here in terms of the martyrs, but we do know that <clears throat> during the tribulation, when we get to that, there's a special place at the throne of God for the tribulation saints that have been martyred for their faith. So God sees, he's watching, there'll be a reward. And then the, lastly, the compensation is for those who, who overcome. And we've already mentioned the fact that the overcomers, according to John, are, are those who have placed their faith in, uh, in Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> tremendous uh, words for Jesus for a particular church that did exist at the time of John's writing in about 95 AD. 
We've already mentioned that the word church is, plural, is used over and over again. There have always been churches for 2,000 years that have undergone persecution, and that's not going to change. Uh, and that persecution is really driven uh, in terms of uh, coming from the devil or out of the pit of the hell. And uh, in that sense, we all come under that kind of attack, even though it may not be so severe that we would uh, have to surrender our life to the flames as a result. But that will be the case in the future. And that's one of the things as we get to chapter 4 and we begin to look at the, at the events that lead to the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. Uh, once that begins, anybody that places their faith in Jesus Christ will be martyred for their faith. There's going to be those that are spared, that are able to take the gospel out. We'll talk more about them. But uh, horrific times uh, ahead. How will, you, how will you get through that? I remember somebody, I, <laughs> I had a quote from Corey Timboom uh, a couple of months ago, and somebody asked me you know, about, uh, about her. And, of course, she uh, and her family hid, hid Jews during the uh, Holocaust, but eventually were arrested, went to, uh, went to a concentration camp themselves where she witnessed the death of her entire family, but she survived. And, uh, and later... Uh, was even given the opportunity as she was sharing in a church, she was approached by a man who confessed that he was one of the prison guards in the camp where her family died, asking her forgiveness. And she was saying, that was tough. But she also said that, you know, God gives you the grace to do those things at that moment. You know, we always wonder what would it be like for us? Would we be able to endure uh, and I think that uh, we would, if we're faithful to him now, we'll be faithful to him then. We can rely upon the faithfulness and the grace of God uh, in our lives. So when we get slandered, <laughs> we're just going to take it and know that if it's happening, God's allowing it. It's for a reason. We're just going to move on and share, share the love of God with, with others and trust that God will use it all for his glory. 